Yeah. Oh yeah, here's a young bull. This is the fun part. The young bulls, before they're three years old, don't have the thick horns on their foreheads yet. And at that point, they're still tolerated with the herd. Um, but we know from captive animals that some of these young bulls are capable of fathering offspring. So the herd bull is having an eye on them, and they kind of have to stay on the periphery of the herd. So here's one of these young bulls. This guy's a two-year-old. And he, he watched very closely what the big, guy, the big guy is doing, and now he's practicing on a young cow, which is always very comical because he has no clue what to do yet. He doesn't have the moves down. He doesn't have it in the right order. He doesn't have the patience or the fine touch, never mind all that courtship you know, stuff. He just wants to get up there right away. And of course, she won't have it. She's like, leave me alone, you creep. If <laughs> you think, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> But they learn from each other. I mean, you can, you can literally watch them, these young bulls, watch in awe as the big bull goes about his business. They just stand and they follow him around and they look. And uh, it's really kind of cute. And likewise, the, the young cows are very interested in when a baby is born. They come and they have a look. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, like all social animals, they learn a lot from each other just by watching. So here's a little clumsy attempt there. That's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> Here they are, bull, cow, they're both, well she might be three, but he's two. So see here, he still has ho uh, hair on his forehead, but it's gonna grow over with horn during his next year. Yep, oh well. <laughs> well, now here, this is um, sort of a picture that was in one of my, my, my uh, thesis papers. Um, just interesting, uh, like there's always a little bit of misconception about this, this, this concept of leadership. The bull may be the biggest, most dominant animal in the group, but he's not the leader in terms of the one who determines where we go next. That's usually the cows. And the older cows sort of share the role of leadership. You know, they're the ones who say, okay, we're going to go over there now and we're going to eat that stuff now. But the bull will try to manipulate their movements during the breeding season because he wants to have them where he can have an eye on them, where he can control them so they don't sneak off and, you know, go get married somewhere else. <laughs> And this is just a couple of scenarios that I uh, sort of put into a little graph, like, you know, cows traveling along a beach. But he has other ideas. He doesn't want them to go in that direction. So he keeps blocking their way. He keeps moving in front of them, blocking their way, and turning them around. And this repeated itself several times until they finally gave up and said, OK, then you just tell us where you want to go. And then he, for a while, got to lead the way. <laughs> and another scenario, this is like a little peninsula jutting out into the uh, into a lagoon and the cow and there was lush grasses there so the cows wanted to feed there and then they and he loved it he loved it because he, he was guarding the entrance of the peninsula and he had everybody in his view and you know had it under perfect control but then when they wanted to leave he has a cow leaving he blocked them he didn't want them to leave so he kind of imprisoned them on this peninsula there for a while <laughs> of course it didn't last forever I mean eventually they have to eat again but but that's a little subtle ways in which he tries to manipulate where the group is going, but he's not in full control, not really. Well, well as soon as the plants lose their color or uh, you know, uh, are no longer green, some of them are no longer so good to eat. So the, the willows usually get abandoned by the time they turn yellow. These are sedges here, a little wedge of uh, a wet sedge box. This is Cape Cruisenstern, north, north of Kotzebue. A couple of muskox in there. And of course, soon it's winter time. And during winter, I mean, this is at least six months out of the year, uh, food is very scarce. I mean, much of it is just brown and gone and dried up, and there's lots of dried <coughs> grasses still and sedges, those they can eat. They're not as nutritious as they are in the summer, but it's, it's good enough to, to get them through the winter. Their digestive system is so efficient, they still get nutrients out of those. Here's four young bulls, well, two younger ones. These are younger and these are older. The younger ones still have sort of a white, pristine look about their horn bosses. And now after the rutting season, their testosterone level just goes and they become very docile and very friendly again. And they don't mind hanging out together during the winter because you know there's no girls to fight over at that time of year. So they're all very peaceful. Here's one of those places where they feed in the winter. But this picture was taken in summer. So this is one of those high and dry places. Uh, this is as lush as it'll ever be. Uh, this is mountain avens, and there's a few little sedges sticking out of there, and that's about it. I mean, there's not much to bite. 
in the winter time the place looks like this. So you can see there's little snow there because the wind blows it away and that's what um, musk oxen are looking for. They don't deal well with deep snow, which sounds like a contradiction for an arctic animal, but during the many, many years of the ice age it was so dry up here there was probably less snow than there is today. And if the snow piles up a little bit they have to crater, so they use their hooves or maybe their noses to push the snow away and get to the vegetation. So here's one of those places where a muskox has taken a couple of bites and it's just the sedges bitten off so an inch above the ground. But not much to bite really. And that's what they live on for six months of the year. So they they can do this because A, they have put on a fat reserve during the summer, so hopefully they're fat by the time they go into the winter. And B, because their digestive system is enormously efficient. And also a C, <laughs> they're very energy conservative. They conserve energy by moving as little as possible in the winter. So they might spend the whole six months up there on the hilltop like that, without hardly ever moving anywhere. So here it is, one of those high snow-free areas. That one too, I guess that's the same photo as earlier. Well, we're almost at the end here, but a little bit about, you've heard about their predator strategy. This is another thing musk oxen are famous for, the so-called defensive circle. Um, when you're an energy conservative animal and you're not in the, in the position to run very far or very fast and you want to save energy, then your predator strategy reflects that as well. Uh, these things here are supposed to be caribou. From, they look like lobsters, but I guess these are supposed <laughs> to be antlers. <laughs> when uh, a group of caribou is disturbed by a predator, they run. You know, sometimes they scatter in all directions, confusing the predator. Caribou are made for running. They've got long legs. They have very, very efficient locomotion. They don't burn much energy running. Not musk oxen, though. They burn a lot of energy, and they overheat very quickly, even in winter. So their strategy is just the opposite. Come together and lock shoulders. And that's an instinct that they have from birth. Just uh, when there's trouble, come together, lock shoulders. When I was bottle raising little calves in, on the farm in Fairbanks, remember Ingrid? <laughs> and her, she had a brother named Tor and the first year they were just calves they had been taken away from their real mothers at the age of I don't know six weeks so they you know hadn't really been raised by muskox and then the first winter when they were like um, I don't know nine months old or so I was in their pasture working on the uh, filling their hay feed or whatever and I had this four-wheeler and it broke down and it was 40 below and I was cranky so I had a hissy fit right there and I said <laughs> kicked the four wheeler and lost all kinds of you know expletives whatnot. Next thing I know here come Ingrid and Tor galloping across the pasture and before I knew it I had one on either side of me locking, locking up with me. <laughs> one here, one there, just standing. Oh. <laughs> and um, it occurred to me then, oh my, you know, I'm like their mother and I shouted the alarm so they all came <laughs> and then we're making an offensive circle wow. just in case. <laughs> So nobody had ever taught them that. This was hardwired into their little brain. <coughs> Danger, run together, you know, stand side by side. So that's what musk oxen do automatically when they're in trouble. So that's how this defensive circle automatically comes about. It's not all that organized, you know. It's really just sort of a shovel and everybody's moving and bumping around. And somebody is always facing the wrong way. So you see <laughs> six horns and one butt sticking out. But the point is still, if you're a predator, and you had to get one out of there, yeah? Wouldn't be so easy, right? If you approached this, you would be met with a lot of horns. <laughs> but of course, unfortunately, it's very ineffective against guns, but and also bows and arrows and spares. So ever since humans showed up, including Ice Age humans, musk oxen have been very easily hunted. And uh, sometimes they break the circle and run, and this is when a predator like a bear or a wolf can get lucky, so now they can run after this group and grab whoever is in the, in the rear, usually a young animal. Anyway, <laughs> so who are the predators of musk oxen? <coughs> Nowadays it's pretty easy. It's humans, certainly. There's wolves, uh, grizzly bears. Uh, polar bears have been observed to eat musk oxen in a couple occasions now. You know, they're running out of sea ice, so more and more often now they actually hunt on the land. But not so long ago, during the Ice Age, there were many other predators here, and musk oxen you know, their, their evolution for most of their time on Earth has happened in the presence of these other predators as well. So this defensive strategy reflects those predators of the past as well as the ones we still have. So we had lions here, uh, Arctic lions during the Ice Age. We had saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, which is a larger species of wolf, short-faced bears. Nowadays, researchers tell us saber-toothed cats 
I don't know if they would have eaten musk oxen, maybe. They were probably more like an ambush predator. Short-faced bears were most likely more of a scavenger. But certainly lions, I mean, lions, we, we still know what, we still have lions on Earth, so we can know pretty well how they hunt. You know, they can take down uh, buffalo and even elephants, so I'm sure they would have hunted musk oxen.